Hello, everyone. My name is Neha Mansur, and I'm the Senior Manager of Programs at the Gardner Museum. Welcome to the fifth iteration of our Three Works program. Today, the Gardner Museum's Chief Curator, Sequoia Miller, will be in conversation with Linda Sequora. They will be discussing a selection of Linda's work in relationship to the concept of agency. The conversation between Sequoia and Linda will be around 30 minutes, and a Q&A will follow. We invite you to send us questions through the Q&A function at any point. You will notice your uh, mics and videos are muted and the chat option has been disabled. And please note that this program is being recorded and live streamed through Facebook Live. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that Toronto is located on the treaty lands and ancestral territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Pitoon, and the Mississaugas of the Credit Nation. The community we work in is the home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to learn and live on this land. I'll now turn off my video and mic and hand it over to Sequoia and Linda. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. It's great to um, uh, be with you all today on a lovely um, summer afternoon here in Toronto. Uh, I'm delighted to be welcoming Linda Sikora. Linda, um, you're welcome to turn on your mic and your camera. Hey, hello. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, I'll start off by introducing Linda. So Linda Sakura um, is a potter. She resides with her family near Alfred, New York, where she has a studio practice and is also a professor of ceramic art at Alfred University. Originally from Canada, uh, Linda attended the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design University, and then for graduate school, uh, the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis, where she earned her MFA. Sakura has worked and exhibited nationally and internationally, including residencies in the US, Korea, Taiwan, and Australia. Her work is included in the collections of the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia, the Racine Art Museum, the LA County Museum of Art, and the, Indi uh, sorry, the Minneapolis Institute of the Arts, among others. In 2020, uh, Linda Sakura received a United States Artist Fellowship, a prestigious unrestricted award to working artists across disciplines. So congratulations on that award, Linda, and welcome, uh, welcome to Three Works this afternoon. Thank you, Sequoia. Uh, I think I would like to start off um, by first asking you uh, just how things have been the last couple months. It's been such a, uh, an unusual time for so many of us. I'm wondering kind of how you're faring. Sure. Um, well, uh, before I begin, I'd like just to add on to your land acknowledgement that I'm speaking from the uh, ancestral and traditional lands of the Onondaga, uh, Seneca Nation, Iroquois Confederacy of Nations, and honor and celebrate this territory. Uh, it's been uh, uh, somewhat abstract, um, but also um, uh, um, intense. Uh, I think uh, there's a lot to process uh, coming out of, uh, you know, an academic environment and um, not really stopping the school year and continuing to meet with students vis-a-vis uh, -vis COVID and vis-a-vis -vis the um, Black Lives Matter movement and protests. So it's been um, full and deep. Wow. Have you been uh, able to work in your studio? Yeah, so the last uh, month I've started in there more uh, consistently. So I've, this is good timing for me to do this because just organizing myself and knowing that you are going to have these three works to look at, I went back and went in and found some points of departure that I'm looking forward to getting into. So uh, good timing. Oh, great. That's really good to hear, actually. And, and I find it so interesting, too, when... Um, you know, when a maker kind of starts up again and sort of shifts focus back into the work, like what are the entry points and what are kind of the starting points? Because we need to, you, you know, you sort of need to pick up some of the threads, but also not all of the threads because you want to kind of find new ones. So um, maybe a good place to start would be to um, be speaking about this drawing table piece uh, from 2013, um, which viewers should be able to see on their screens. And um, maybe you could start off by just sort of uh, explaining to us a bit about what, what we're seeing. Well, like with a lot of uh, projects that come out of the studio, this one ended up being this confluence. Uh, so it was a confluence of works and research that was going on in the studio at the time, 
um, uh, what was going on sort of politically, uh, globally at the time, and also an invitation to do an exhibition, uh, a drawing show. And I hadn't uh, entered uh, or, or done a drawing show or been part of a drawing show before. Um, and, uh, but simultaneous to getting that invitation, I had begun to work with this pattern um, the pattern uh, was actually, it was during the Arab Spring, if you look at the date, and the pattern was um, coming out of just going back and looking through a lot of Middle Eastern ceramics, you know, uh, potters, uh, ceramists look to sort of the, the, the Mideastern and especially the 13th, 12th, 13th, 14th centuries as one of sort of the pivotal um, uh, moments in, in the history of ceramics. So I went back and in there, and I think because, not consciously, but simply because there was so much, much broadcasting about um, that part of the world. Anyways, that's, that's how it began. Um, I don't know if you want me to go a little further with, with uh, des describing what's here. Maybe, uh, maybe we'll, I'll pick up this question of drawing and ask you sort of what the role of drawing is in uh, both in this piece and in your work. How you... Okay. Um, so I, I think because I'm a thrower, you know, typically a lot of the work I make, thro I throw. And um, those plates there are thrown. And I think throwing is drawing. You know, it's, mm. it's a way of drawing, right? So, you know, and I often think about it that way. And I think that drawing is essential. Um, an essential practice for a thrower uh, so that you can really see form and, and understand form um, in its sort of, not only in its profile, but in its sort of dimensional complexity as well. So I've always found that um, really important. I'm notorious for going to museums and only getting to about three view about three things because I'm stopping and drawing. I get very interested and, you know, because drawing is a way of looking. Mm -hmm. It's a way of looking, it's a way of seeing, it's a way of sort of taking something in that uh, non-intellectually, uh, taking it in physically. Mm -hmm. and, and that's something else I would say about this period in time. It's a very, um, uh, everything going on politically is a very physical experience. I find it very in the body. A lot of what I'm uh, experiencing is in the body. Anyways, in this piece, um, I was working with a motif. There was a motif, and um, I had taken that motif, extracted it, and started to play around with generating it into a field. So it was a singular motif that you can actually see on the plates. And then on the vellum, there's a sort of positioning of this, so it becomes this infinite pattern. And so there's a question in the work, that's one of the questions that is in the work that has to do with the singularity of these objects and also the relationship of that to this field. And if you think about singularity and also this kind of uh, infinite metaphorically, you know, that's where you get to some of the background of where work comes from. I'm not consciously, I'm not consciously overlaying that conceptually the work actually reported that back to me as I was in the process. Well, there's so many things, there's so many questions that come up for me based on um, what you were just talking about. One that I'd like to start with is this um, connection between throwing and drawing as being sort of fundamentally, if not the same, but very closely related practice and linking um, that to the distinction that's often made between object and ornament. And if we think of drawing as a two-dimensional practice that, you know, happens on a surface and in a ceramic context, it would be on the surface typically of a three-dimensional object or a tile, say, um, versus throwing being the kind of object itself. If we're link, if you're linking, we're linking um, throwing and drawing, you're also linking image and object. And I'm wondering then how, and in this piece, you're kind of, in a way you're um, extrapolating or separating image and object or sort of troubling the relationship between with them a bit, uh, between them a bit with the vellum, I would say. Uh, so I'm thinking about, I don't know exactly what the question is, but <laughs> I'm thinking about this, can, uh, a sort of where, what the relationship between image and object and surface is to you also within this context of the separation that you're creating with the vellum in this piece, which is almost like a projection of sorts. I think of it almost as like a filmic or a sort of cinematic um, separation. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a nice, that's a nice observation. Um, image and object. Yes, I think about that a lot. And in, in fact, I was thinking of talking about this in the, in the next piece a little bit as well. But one thing um, I've been uh, puzzling over or thinking about are just how work is performative, right? And especially when you're making functional work, um, how, how it is performative. And I think a real obvious way to understand it has to do with its common function. And, you know, the interesting thing about functional pottery is that the um, knowability of it, um, its um, commonality actually enacts its disappearance, right? Mm -hmm. So because we know it, we think we know it, we don't really have to pay a lot of attention to it. It sort of disappears. But mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in, you know, when we formalize something like in this, in, in this situation or, or maybe more explicitly in the groups that we'll look at too, um, it's performing in one way visually, and then it's also uh, you can uh, interact with it. You could probably take those objects and employ them. So as I'm, you know, thinking about this, which is in some way where I'm going to start in the studio, so good question. Um, I was thinking about the phrase performative, uh, performative utterance, right? So in a performative utterance, um, that would be something like I apologize, you know, yeah. I apologize for being a part of it. <laughs> I apologize, you know, or I acknowledge. And so the speaker is both, uh, you know, in saying that, they're both performing an act, um, but they're not just saying what they're doing. They're actually, the saying is the doing, mm -hmm. right? So so I'm, I'm trying to sort of understand the complexity of that. Some of it has to do with proximity, right? So if you sort of stand back and you... Uh, taken a work from a distance, then there's a separation. And I think there's uh, a way that that's, uh, that's sort of understood. And when you get in close, of course, you become entangled with it. So um, I'm not sure that exactly answers your question, but to veer it into the performative and just, you know, for me right now, taking in the real complexity of that. And part of that has to do with the fact that I spend so much time in the classroom and not in the studio. Um, it's not that I can do serial production at all, in fact. I'm almost mm -hmm. primarily based in research uh, and coming up with uh, prototype groups. In a way, teaching is like the ultimate performative utterance, right? Because the entire act of teaching is, is, the, is the performative utterance in its way. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so I'm moving on to the second uh, to the second work that you that you brought for this crockery group, um, which is part of an ongoing series started in 2014. This is one kind of selection from it. Um, I think this might be a good um, a good place to pick up this idea of singularity versus infinitude, or maybe singularity versus the multiple, or singularity versus the collective, and um, also, I love that you use the word employ around functional pots, the word employ. You said that like when we put a pot, when we start to use the pot, we're employing it. We're sort of putting it to work in a way, which also makes me think of kind of like the socialist twinge around uh, collective versus individual and like what are our collective jobs <laughs> really in the, in the large sense. So um, I guess a very straightforward question that would come out of that sort of set of questions would be like, what's the role of the group in this object? Why are these, why are these works kind of collected and how do they hold together and how do you see them as a discrete uh, collection? Yeah. So I think like with the table piece and like with a lot of things that happen in the studio, it comes out of a particular uh, set of experiences and, and moment in time, you know, so uh, the table piece, um, you know, two things that, that collided there had to do with just when it was happening in history, but also I had traveled to Iran several years before with a good friend of mine, Sana Mamani, and so that was uh, very influential. Um, this group here is uh, in some way um, connected to just things that were around me. Uh, my uh, partner, Matthew Metz, um, has, is American, and his parents had this a pretty tremendous collection of crocs. Um, and we live, we've lived with those, you know, fewer now that we're in a smaller house, but we've lived with those. 
So this was an idea about crockery. Um, I think the group itself had to do with the sort of um, uh, notion, um, well, I think initially it really just had to do with the something just very elemental. All those vases, for example, store inside those boxes, the cylindrical boxes, they fit in those boxes. Um, the teapots, if you can see in the small image, the teapots are, are, are very uh, directly thrown. They're sort of, um, they're barely trimmed. They're cut off the wheel. The bottom does not have a cut foot. Um, uh, the lids, they're inverted to be fired. The lids become like a setter in the wood kiln. Uh, so you can see how the, on the teapot, the pattern is flowing up. Uh, there's a grip on the top of the handle. Um, the crock, the crocks are very much crocks, you know, that one in the front looks like a croc. So it's a sort of play with elegant, you know, what's elegant and what's elemental. Um, and, um, and I think maybe resisting, res there's a resistance as a group. There's a, there's sort of a resistance of representing uh, 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 sort of um, utility. Uh, there's a resistance to maybe interruption uh, and portability. Um, it sort of maybe enforces that idea that pots function aesthetically and carry with them an impact. Uh, so, so, you know, I think that resistance is essential. And I think the group uh, permits that. Um, there's other sort of minutia in the research, like the rims are hard edged and blunt and, um, uh, you know, there's other minutia in there that talks about how they are sourced. There's a little, there's sort of a joke about turning because they have this surface that looks like wood grain and they could have been turned from wood because they're so symmetrical. So these things are just, you know, building there. But but to groups and individuation, I think it really is something like this reason, or, or more, most significantly, it's about this resistance. Um, but I'm also wondering if they're even more functional in certain ways or more operative in certain ways as a group untouched. Um, my students used to always complain about putting their work on a pedestal, or at least for a while, there was a fashionable moment where it's like, I don't want my work on a white pedestal. And, or I don't want my work in a gallery space. I want it to be used. And I'm like, yes, but, you know, um, put it on, you know, I'm also saying, you know, put it out there, look at it, stand back, keep your hands off and, and you know, engage your mind, you know, take something and visually think about something because this exercise of thinking, as we know, is um, uh, really important. You know, it's at a premium, I think. Mm. That, you know, we're in a moment right now where just the idea of having an inner dialogue, you know, Hannah Arendt, you know, talks about this ability to be able to have two voices in your head. What am I seeing? You know, one thing I like about this group is that it almost camouflages itself, right? You have to get in. You can't always distinguish the forms. So, you know, if you can ask yourself a question like, what am I seeing? If you can have a conversation in your head, you can have a conversation with someone else. I mean, Hannah Arendt says you can't, unless you can do that, right? Unless you can have some kind of discussion with yourself and disagree with yourself, you really can't do it out in the world, right? So, you know, in some ways, I think that is, you know, another aspect of how this operates. You know, from, it's interesting how these works reveal themselves over time and how little I know about them. Because right now, you know, I'm inclined just to say to you, so what do you see? Because there's a whole other layer of, of, of uh, there's a lot going on in there that I don't know about. I love, I love a couple of connections you've made. So just now this one about knowing and, and what you referred to before is the knowability of pottery. And, and there's also this unknowability, right? This absence of knowing, um, both about what your work is as an artist or as a maker, but also about pots in particular, I think, and, and which links to this, to the notion of their visibility versus their invisibility and sort of what are the um, fibers connecting that knowability and visibility, I think is, um, something I don't know, <laughs> something that's sort of a tricky one. Yeah, that's nice. I mean, it reminds me, I was, I was um, 
getting ready to do a panel and I didn't know where to start. <laughs> so I took one of the, I took a book and I opened it. You know, you do that thing, you point to the page. And I pointed to this line that said, some things are too large or too small to be seen. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, that sort of set off this whole um, uh, thinking about what that means, but also in, in visibility and in, in visibility. I think that's, you know, very important or, you know, uh, identification, fostering, disappearance. The other thing that was going on in these groups is I was thinking about these platforms of service and storage and display, right? So these are, you know, platforms that mm-hmm. uh, that these pieces operate in. And, um, you know, in terms of, uh, I mean, this is display, literally, <laughs> Uh, you know, the the image on the screen, uh, but also in person. But under service, I started unpacking um, other aspects of some of the forms themselves and had given a talk where I talked about the mythological terrine, the the hardworking teapot. There wasn't a terrine in this group. And then the obsolete pitcher. These were all things that started coming out of thinking about service storage and display and the way the way these objects operate, you know, sort of actually and metaphorically, you know, as individuated. Yeah, and I think that those this, this issue of service and display and how objects operate also raises the question of agency, of course, and the extent to which they're subjects versus objects. And I'm um, wondering if you think of these as uh, primarily as subjects or primarily as objects or as um, able to switch. I would say they're both. You know, um, I think they're they're both things, and they can move back and forth. And and I think you know, with service storage and display, what's what why I rested on that that trio um, had to do with what I was making over time, but it also had to do with those things being gestures, right? So when you serve, it's a gesture, right? When you display, it's a gesture. And even when you store, it's a gesture. You know, I, you know, this idea of a jar, you know, you think a jar is doing nothing. <laughs> but, you know, a jar is like when it's sitting there, you know, I mean, some jars are in and out of. But, you know, a jar can sort of just sit there and it can be actively uh, holding things for durations that are much longer than a lifetime, right, or many lifetimes. So it's yeah. a very active object in its stasis. But, um, but these gestures, of course, are not just household scale. They're not just human one-to-one scale. The idea of service on a global level, the idea of sort of display and storage, these things sort of um, can happen on an individual level, but they can also sort of happen on a sort of large scale uh, global level. So that was another, you know, um, uh, reason that I settled on that trio and sort of have leaned on that type of thinking about the gesture of things to allow for the complexity and even to give myself permission to, to teach and to not be in the studio uh, and, and um, producing work and to be uh, feel still um, contributory, you know, and uh, uh, connected. Um, through making that, that might not disseminate as rapidly yeah. as someone that wasn't teaching. <laughs> <laughs> right, dissemination is a key thing, but I think that the connection that you're making between like the domestic and the and the uh, political and the cultural and the global, this sort of question of scale kind of shows the way that your thinking is um, integrated into, in, in all of these aspects, that there's a full link between those, which I think is, um, is a particular and valuable um, kind of point of view or perspective on that, for sure. Um, slight, go ahead. No, no. Oh, I was just going to say a slightly more sort of nerdy. <laughs> answer, I'm all for nerdy. Yeah. <laughs> answer to agency. You know, of course, those of us that work with material think about material a lot. I mean, one of my um, most recent favorite people to follow is uh, and listen to is um, uh, Julia Brian Wilson and uh, some of the connections she's making to other scholars who are researching uh, indigenous epistemologies. And um, we can talk about that in the next slide too, but, but the nerdy path comes through material culture. And of course, all of the scholarship that's been amping up around that 
And so George Kubler was the foundation, right? For me anyways, it was George Kubler, The Shape of Time. And then it goes to Heidegger, right? And, and the thing, you know, the thing thinging. And then, of course, the contrary to that, which is Bill Brown thing theory. And then it goes to Baudrillard and relational aesthetics. So, you know, I'm sort of skipping through these ideas. And then I get down to Jane Bennett and her writing about um, enchantment and vibrant matter. Right. And then, you know, it sort of comes back into, you know, other things like labor. So it gets into this idea, which is which is really active in the culture, which has to do with the multiplicity of things. You know, so not only agency as being something that's much like for an object to have agency, being able to open that in terms of the way it could potentially influence an outcome um, by being present in a room, um, but just also how things like disciplinarity is breaking down. You know, the way that fields are connecting to find enough range to be more effective in um, uh, communicating um, whatever it is, you know, the information that's behind it. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, that's uh, just, an, that's the nerdy side. Yeah, you know, that's great. I'm really glad you brought the material culture question in because that that's in itself an example of disciplinarity breaking down as an interdisciplinary field. It's not sort of one thing or another thing. Um, and I guess in thinking, so when I was thinking about agency and in terms of these objects, I was also thinking about Bruno Latour and um, actor network theory and the sort of the, the notion of the kind of consciousness of objects and the, um, the, the objects sort of lead the path. And, um, and also the, the idea of the objects such as these having a social life or having a biography, which is, you know, was brought to the table a while ago by um, uh, Arjuna Potterai that these that objects sort of change meanings as they shift um as they move through the world and uh and kind of generate new identities i, I do though want to bring back i want to bring this the question of agency to a very um kind of narrow point in a way and to ask you about both in this collection of works and in the next piece which we'll go to now um about roundness and about the agency of the wheel in a sense you describe yourself right away as a thrower and i was um sort of thinking about what how the forms that we're looking at and their roundness um, connects to this idea of the agency of the tool. And you're using that tool in particularly because you began your work um, uh, when you started off, much of your work was, was not round. And I think you made a very sort of conscious move toward making objects round. So curious for you to speak to the idea of roundness, agency, and the wheel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that... Um... Yeah, it was a very conscious decision. And I think at, I came through a school, I came through sort of the school of a lot of building and altering um, work and trying to make work that was more aberrant. Um, and there were, I think there were two motivations. One was I became really interested in invisibility and assumption and familiarity um, as these, these, these spaces that can be both um, uh, empowered and disempowered in some way, um, that there was, a, um, there was a certain kind of um, connection maybe that could be made um, through the assumption and familiarity. And, and that I was quite happy to have the work disappear uh, if it could reappear in the moment, in certain moments. It could announce itself in certain moments. And in fact, wasn't particularly interested in the spectacle or, the, or sort of the, you know, the, the unusual per se. And that, so that was, so, so one, one part of it had to do with just how that work operated in the world or how I saw it also connected to these very fundamental um, traditional ways of, of taking clay from the earth and molding it, making it. Um, and, then, and then otherwise, I think that I, I felt like that act of engaging and throwing would change me. It would change my body. It would change my, the way I thought or felt about the work. It would change the way my mind worked in the studio. Um, I think in a manner that I... Uh, thought would be productive. 
Hmm. And and those were really the, the sort of that was sort of the, the balancing act. And so it's it was, you know, it was sort of um <laughs> you know, body life. You know, I could sort of it was very much that. And uh, but I think, you know, there was this forum of sort of speaking is an unnatural forum for me. You know, the sort of where I, where I sort of am at my most natural is when I'm, you know, sort of alone and working and reading and, and you know, scrawling notes all over the wall that I'll never look at again or I go back and say, what was that about? Uh, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so, so but, but there's also, too, I think something about the way that the brain has to work when you throw um, hmm. the concentration, the intensity, the way you have to hold your body. Um, so it was, it was many layered. It was psychological. It was physical. It was, um, you know, it had to do with the ideas in the work, conceptual. Can you speak to how, um, now having spent so many years throwing as your primary practice, how that has impacted your, your body and your mind? Oh gosh, I don't know. I might have to get one of my. <laughs> <laughs> might have to come back to that. <laughs> well, I love how you do this as a way of like. <laughs> well, you know, it's so it's it's interesting. I mean, I think I feel we all feel a lot through our body. I suppose. Yeah. But, you know what strikes me about this political moment in this country, being Canadian too, and here, and also sort of transporting back and forth between. Uh, medias uh, or news media is just just how physical it is you know taking in you know how I feel this political moment is that um you know I'm not sure I mean I think it you know it's the type of it's the type it, it's work it's labor I think that work and labor um is is somewhat releases me from my sort of nerdy proclivity to comb through books and underline things and Pull things out of context and put stuff together. I, you know, I think they they balance each other in a way that's pretty important. Um, so there's always this fundamental pragmatism and essentialness uh, that gets connected also to just all of this less knowable, uh, all these less knowable aspects of how the work operates that I think it operates. And then of course what it does when it goes out there is a completely uh, another story. It's a different thing, yeah. So you, you've brought up this question of, um, I guess, of language in the form of utterance and in the form of writing a few times. And, um, and, I'm, and I'm wondering how, how or whether, to what extent you think actively about a sort of dynamic interplay between, say, throwing or something that you know physically and how that connects with um, either the performative utterance, maybe in the mode of teaching or in another mode, and with this idea of reading and research or underlining things or making notes to yourself. And how does, like, how might we as viewers or as users of your work see language in an object like, like this Blackware group? It, you know, I think, that, I think that what brought me to language in the first place and, and one of the people that really interested me was Lynn Hoginian, sort of literary theory. So it's people writing uh, about the theory of language and is how ubiquitous language is. Language is everywhere. You know, we use it commonly. We use it in very decorative ways. We, we, we use it through voice or hand or motion. But it, it's, it, it's, it's, it's so essential to community and culture it's also really taken for granted some of the times and other times exalted. So I felt like there was so much kinship to the way a, a domestically intended or domestically derived object such as this, these uh, operates, that there, there, there had to be some guidance in there for me. And uh, that's what brought me to it. And, you know, um, people like, you know, Gertrude Stein have great opinions about repetition. You know, repetition mm -hmm. is a yeah. of the potter, right? <laughs> right? Really great story about how she's in the kitchen and all her aunties are talking and then one comes in and tells a story and then another one arrives and then the story has to be told again and then another one comes in and it has to be told again. And of course the story changes every time it's told. And so she has declared uh, there is no such thing as repetition. Um, but, but it really became a, it became a vehicle for me to really uh, understand the work. And, and I think there was just a lot of, you know, shared um uh you know um 
the way it transitions from being uh, sort of really utilitarian to being really, uh, you know, elegant or or decorative or poetic, right? So so I started following it uh, for those clues, right? So there's the ideas in it itself, which are amazing. Uh, you know, if you look at poetics, there's that, but then there's simply also just what it is as material. Mm. In a way, it connects to the image object idea in a sense too, right? It does. And just the way thing, meaning changes over time, you know, or how sure. meaning is derived or how individual meaning is, you know, how interpretation really works. You know, lately I've been looking at Emily Wilson, who's the first woman to translate the Odyssey. And because she's the first woman to translate the Odyssey, she takes this word polytropos and she does something with it that has never been done before because she has a set of experiences and a point of view in the world. Mm -hmm. And um, she's, you know, she's very um, respectful of the original text and not changing the meaning too much. But you see how the, the sort of the main, you know, sort of the hero of the Odyssey, the way that, that, that um, the way you understand that poem when she makes this interpretation because uh, she calls him a complicated man. Right. Right. Which is very different than a lot of the other interpretations, um, which set set this person out to be very ultimately masculine and heroic in different types of ways. But for her, it becomes that polytropos many turns mm -hmm. becomes about complexity. It doesn't actually become about these other interpretations. Um, I want to pick up. the. Uh, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. I want to pick up this idea of um, being respectful of the historical text in the context of this work, of the Blackware group work. Um, I also want to flag for our participants, our listeners, that we'll be opening it up to questions in, in a few minutes. And so I'd encourage you to start typing in some questions that you'd like me to, to relay to Linda. Um, but before then, uh, um, thinking about being respectful of, of a text, these work, work like this and work like the previous group are really clearly drawing from uh, historical ceramics. And I'm curious sort of what you feel like is your relationship to, to history and ceramic history and where you're respectful and where being respectful is not productive or needed and uh, sort of how you negotiate that relationship. I think, I think that, um, sorry, there's a fire alarm going off in my house now. <laughs> um, is that okay? Yeah, I think we'll be fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, history is, history is, is com complex. You know, it's, you know, I'm definitely working in a, a lineage. I, I think I'm not sure. I become less sure what, history is as time goes on, because as I get older, um, the sort of uh, snapshot of time I'm working in is so, so has so much minutia. It's, it's, or sorry, it's so minute compared to the larger scope. So um, I had a revelation of history when I was traveling in Iran and Sanam and I went up to went to this mosque and we had a tour of this mosque and Genghis Khan had initiated the building of this thing and they were renovating it. We went inside and it was full of scaffolding. And then she, the tour, the woman that was touring us took us down underneath and was explaining to us um, how when the mosque was conceived, it was this, the largest of its time, it was built from these bricks. And as it was built, the weight of the thing was pushing the foundation. So they were simultaneously building the foundation and had built a studio kiln and glaze lab to finish the dome. And I just realized that the whole time we were traveling around Espah Espahan and Tehran and Kashan and going to all of these amazing uh, mosques and, and uh, courtyards, uh, and people, you could hear this tapping all the time of people taking tiles out and they were renovating these spaces. And actually I realized they weren't renovating at all. In fact, they were still building. They were just making it basically. They were just making it. And it completely sort of uh, became the most rational way to think about time. Um, and, and it's the way I've come to think about other other time, I sort of, you know, I feel like I am a scholar of these traditions 
that the, um, the excellence of workmanship was so uh, profound um, because of the concentration, cultural sort of uh, uh, concentration and intensity and, and locality. So in some way, I think that in such a disseminated type of a world, I feel like I have to work for, for that space in a way. Um, so I'm, I'm quite amateur often or feel quite amateur relative to that. But, you know, with this piece here, um, you know, this actually, in fact, came out of thinking, trying to strip away uh, maybe some of the work uh, out of the polychrome glazing work, uh, not necessarily wood grain, but the pattern work to try to strip away some of that more cultural identity. And when the forms were being crafted, they were very, they were thought of very formally, like very much as, as spheres and cylinders and, um, uh, you know, uh, ovals and, you know, or not ovals, but, you know, uh, shapes that were, were geometric, hard edges, uh, non-decorative per se. Mm. You know, that was some of the feeling in the work. The surface itself really came out of, um, it was sort of, it was just an accident. The surface was an accident and it sort of set me on this path of texturing. There's a really, um, uh, but, but, but recently I was listening to a lecture about um, a Canadian artist, Rebecca Belmore, who, a uh, sculptor, who, but, but there was a description of her making these beads. And I think it was uh, Brian Wilson was talking about, you know, the imprint of the clay, talking about sort of, again, indigenous practices and just the meaningfulness of objects and objects as life, and then the clay and texture. And um, I think it was Eve Sedgwick that said something about the, or she quoted her saying something about the, the, the scribing that was in the beads as being, bringing up this question of how was it made? And it's interesting to me because people always ask me about these, how was it made? And I might be totally geeking out on English uh, tankards that were in the pubs with the combing. And just a little aside, someone told me before I got to Alfred, there was a sign up on an office, one office door that said no combing back, <laughs> back in the 70s. <laughs> Excellent. But, so here I am, right? But anyways, um, I'm geeking out on that. <laughs> but also this, but this thing, someone said to me, so how do you do this? And I said, well, and it was a workshop, right? How do you make this texture? Or it was an exhibition. I said, well, don't ask me how I did it. Ask me why I did it. Right. So, you know, there's the how, there's the there's the how, there's a why. And I think to go back to the beginning, when you go into history, I think you got to bring the why, you know, ask why, you know, ask why. And, and so that so that the work and the intent can talk to you as opposed to just how, which can isolate you from the deeper meaning behind gestures, because you can share a gesture through time. But unless you know something of why it's just a how. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? And so I don't know if that answers that a little somewhat. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think like many of your answers, they open up more questions about um, about the work and what's and what's happening in the work. But I think that now would be a good time for me to start to relate some of the questions uh, that are coming in from the group. So I'd encourage a few more if you're if you have a if you're listening and you have something you'd like to ask, go ahead and type into the Q and A field. Um, so we have one question that links back to um, Hannah Arendt and the idea of agency as a function of action. Um, and the question, I'll just read it, I think would be easiest. How do you, uh, Linda, see the world of objects acting in this realm of action? What is the relationship of the action between the object and the maker? And how does the repetition and groupings in your work speak to the concepts of plurality inherent in the sphere of action? That's a really, really big question. Yeah, it's big and complex. Maybe I would pull out the relationship of action between the object and maker and the idea or concept of plurality as being inherent in the sphere of action. Um, the, I think that, you know, this thing, of, this word agency came out of the article that um, I think it was, wasn't too long after maybe I had made that um, a tableware piece. Um, and he titled the article, 
uh, aesthetics and agency. So, so in some way that, that brought my attention uh, to that. Um, but it was, I think um, the maker, I mean, the maker and agency, you know, I think between the maker and the object, I think that an answer to that would, would, would go deeper into the, what the practice entails. You know, how uh, the practice uh, generates the ground from which work can come. So that's, that has a lot of multiplicity to it um, um, relative to how a life is lived. You know, in terms of, you know, uh, how the work operates after it leaves the studio, I think, you know, this question, how is it made, which, you know, some people might roll their eyes, is really a, a way that a viewer starts to remake it, right? So they start to make it themselves, and especially somebody who, who doesn't really know the material would begin to metaphorically make that object themselves. And so in that they are building ideas and connecting, uh, walking down paths maybe they wouldn't normally walk down, um, you know, moving something from being a singularity of, of, of a nameable to a broader understanding of uh, matter, material, you know, interaction, uh, subject, um, even the myth around a work, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, myth is not, uh, I think mythology, you know, myth, myth is an interesting word. It sounds, you know, Baudrillard and systems of objects sort of uses it to talk about things cycling in and out of use when something stops being useful, it becomes more mythological, but, but, you know, another thinker would say, you know, myth is actually something that teaches us how to live a better life. Um, I don't know if that gets at the question. I almost feel like I have to sit down and go through that point by point, but that person can email me. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, yeah, we could start like a, a, a spin-off dialogue, right? right. Um, another question comes in, uh, relates to the group uh, pieces, um, which is asking you to speak to how you see the relationship of the forms uh, to each other in these sets and how you compose them sort of formally to respond to each other, maybe whether there are leaders in the group and kind of followers and receivers. Yeah, that's actually great. Um, you know, they're, they're, definitely, um, they're definitely tight, a tight group. I think that they really... You know, like for here, for example, a, I rarely make a cup with a saucer under it or a tumbler for that matter. Um, but, you know, the leader in this group would be this kettle. This kettle is quite large. It's oversized. It's actually more than a teapot. It really is a kettle shape. And, and some of what interested me about that was just the way it sort of feels like it impacts your body um, mm. as an object. So these are very tight, and and I'm I'm wondering about that right now. In fact, I have a question about that. About you know, you know these one this group. Well, I don't really. You know, it's funny. I've been calling some of them prototype groups, and I don't even know if that's the right language. I'm hmm. really trying to understand these groups, and I am asking myself right now exactly that question because I think that this next stretch of work might probe that and allow myself to either pull them more tightly together or spread them more further apart and allow their stance of appearing simultaneously to do more. Um, I think I've also been, you know, you take images of them, so they're very frontal. Um, I don't think I, and my tables are against the wall in my studio right now. So I think I need to pull things into the middle and understand more about what the discourse is, you know, how the aesthetic choices and the technical choices push uh, experiences and ideas. Wow, I can't wait to see what comes out of that, um, <laughs> that process and that set of questions. <laughs> um, so one final question. Um, as we're uh, as we're getting close to wrapping up, is a very a very straightforward one around um, being a teacher actually, and asking what advice you have for for students, for ceramic students during these times, but I think also for makers maybe even more broadly. Yeah, 
I was going to solicit the audience for advice on that <laughs> during uh, these times. Um, you know, these times are, um, COVID is one thing. So maybe, um, maybe we think more about these, these, these times um, when, we're, when we can maybe move around more healthily. What's interesting about dealing with the pandemic is the level at which you have to pay attention. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and I've been taking all these online teaching workshops because that's part of what's going to be happening. And of course, I finished my classes up online at the end of the semester. Um, this word came across the radio the other day, radical interdependence, right? Mm -hmm. So this idea of just being even vulnerable enough to depend. Um, but this, this, um, this type of sense of community that is... Um, made itself visible up to us in, 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 a, in a deeper way than any of us really understood it exists at all. So, but then also the significance of sort of bringing an individuated vo voice that can be really distinct into that space, right? So we can think of that in terms of point of view, we can think about that in terms of culture, people of culture, people of color, uh, we can think about that in terms of just uh, background and how things look. You know, we we become, or let me say not we, it's very easy to become aesthetically uh, conditioned and to think that you're not based on your exposure and the cultures you come from is, is, real, is very naive. I've also, you know, I've been looking at shadow feminisms <laughs> lately. And oh, what's that? I haven't heard that term. Well, you know, I hadn't either. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, queer theory is one of my more favorite places um, to dig around as well. And it was um, Judith Halberstam and uh -huh. her um, uh, queer uh, art of failure or something. Right, right, right. I have come across. But it's sort of like the fail, it's sort of this, it's sort of like the failure to, you know, so if you think of a conventional idea about, you know, let's just say feminism and, you know, to like to do and to join and to, you know, sort of to stretch and to grow, it would be sort of to not do, it would be to, to fail. Like this work fails to be considered conceptual by some people. It fails completely in that regard, and God damn it, that's why it's so good. You know? <laughs> and, and that idea of just um, you know, really being conscious of how these uh, categories are generated, how they've been enforced. I mean, it was Foucault that talked about disciplinarity as being just a modernist ploy for power. You know, right. and how it's authoritarian authoritarian and the most progressive institutions need to be hyper conscientious of that as do any of us that think we're keeping up on the you know up on uh are paying attention be conscious of all of that within us which of course is coming so all of that that's going on inside of you right now that is causing your everything to move around and 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 that shifting is really uh, unsettling and uncomfortable and disorienting I would say just walk right into the middle of it. I mean, that's where you have to teach from. Yeah, wow. That's it. You've just done such a great articulation of the connection between the pandemic and the protests that have been going on. I think that's right in the center of what you're speaking to. Yeah. Wow. What a fantastic place to um, arrive at also in the conversation about your work. Thank you. Thank you for this so much. This has been really fascinating, interesting, amazing, great to hear from you and to, to have this opportunity to chat. Thank you. Sequoia, it's been an honor, and um, I'll, um, I'll look forward to talking to you more in the future. Excellent. Um, I have a few announcements. Sorry, did you want to? Thank everyone who came. It's, um, thank you very much. Yeah, excellent. Um, a handful of things to add before before we go. So um, I want to flag that our next uh, Three Works program um, is going to be on August 20th, also a Thursday in two weeks at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Our featured uh, guest will be Brendan Tang, who's an artist based in uh, the Pacific Northwest in uh, British Columbia. We are also um, excited to introduce an event that we're um, 
beginning here at the Gardner uh, entitled Clay Date, and that is a new online art fundraiser for us that is in support of the Gardner Museum. Um, it's presented by the Young Patron Circle, and Clay Date will offer an hour-long virtual clay workshop, which will be led by Toronto-based artist Habiba El Sayed. That's on Tuesday, August 25th at 7 p.m., there is a link that should be coming up in the comments box uh, that you can register in, and registration is open until August uh, 20th. Uh, please also remember that the Gardner Museum is open to the public. You can check our website for hours and other information. We are offering free admission on weekends throughout the summer. Um, and a final thank you um, and expression of gratitude for Linda Sequoia for joining us today. Really, really a treat, and thanks for all of you joining as well. See you next time.